Man is unitary, a simple economic agent. Man's institutions are split, expressing contradictions that must be worked through. And they are worked through in a causative, predictable way. History is science. This is the essence of the dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic. That's what I'd like to discuss in this video. Specifically, I would like to try to explain the Hegelian dialectic in simple terms so that anybody can understand it. And one of the things that I want to say right off the bat is that Hegel never argued for a formal system of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. In fact, nothing could be less Hegelian Hegel was a devout anti-formalist, and his theory of the dialectic was an attempt to go beyond Kantian formalism. In fact, I would like to go as far as saying that the dialectic might even be considered a formalism of anti-formalism, and hopefully by the end of this video that will make sense. But if you want to learn about the dialectic, it makes sense to go all the way back to Plato. Like Hegel, Plato was a great systematizer. And like Hegel, he was responding to a previously dominant idea or school of thought. Hegel was responding to Kant and the Kantian critique of pure reason, which had resulted in two responses, the Fichtian and Schillingian responses. And Plato was responding to the school of the Sophists. Now the Sophists believed that speech was a tool and that therefore it was a skill that could be taught, that speech could be used to lay out in rhetorical torn, written in, in rhetoric, your positions, that anybody could learn it. And Plato really disliked this idea. Plato wanted speech not to simply be a, a tool for social advancement, but to be an expression of a metaphysical system. And it's in this lens that you have to understand the idea of the Socratic dialogue. In the Socratic dialogue, Socrates, the philosopher, speaks with an interlocutor often a student, but sometimes also an opponent, usually a sophist. And Socrates is trying to define seemingly ordinary things, like friendship. And yet the entire purpose of the dialogue is to problematize the seemingly simple, common sense notion of friendship. Therefore, the interlocutor serves to negate Socrates' position. And sometimes this comes in terms of simply affirming Socrates, saying you're so wise, etc. This back and forth allows Socrates, therefore, to negate his own positions and therefore to come up with a higher form of the original concept. Here we have the beginnings of what some might consider thesis, antithesis, synthesis, which is that Socrates starts with a position it is then negated through an antithesis, a rhetorical one that is, and it results in a higher notion, a synthesis of the two. And what's important to note here is that the dialogue was therefore almost a metaphor for the platonic metaphysical binary. Think about it, dialogue simply means double or two reason, dialogos. And Plato believed that the entire system of metaphysics, the logos, was based on a binary conception between the subject, I mean, the subject who exists in the world of appearances, and the ideal form. In fact, this is how you can understand the allegory of the cave. The subject is trapped in the cave, looking at the appearances of the shadows cast upon the cave wall, and the objective of philosophy, and therefore the task of the philosopher, is to exit the cave and to enter into the light of truth. Here we can see even how the metaphor of light functions in a Socratic dialogue, i.e. Socratic dialectical sense. We have the higher form of the fire, namely the sun, and the lower form of the fire in the cave, which casts the shadows. Therefore, the task of the philosopher is to exit the spectral illusions of subjective knowing to enter into the light of objective knowing. It's a simple hierarchy of metaphysics, if you will, by which the subject exists in a lowly world of appearances and wants to be reunited with the higher. You can start seeing here how the Socratic dialectic actually then finds its way into early Christianity and the notion of being cast out of paradise and wanting to be reunited with God.
It's again, the ascension back into the ideal. Now, Hegel is also responding to a school of thought, except it's not the sophists, it's the Kantian problem. The Kantian problem is an inquiry which Kant believes to be a critical one, a Humean one, in fact, even an empirical one, into the Platonic binary. If the Platonic metaphysical binary is between essence and appearance, between the absolute and the subject, between the light of the sun and the light of the cave, then Kant essentially says, why is it that the ideal form only exists in terms of a rational concept? In other words, what Kant essentially posits is a problem. He says, if essence can only be known as a conceptual idea, then can it truly be considered essence? Or is it simply also a shadow? Essentially, Kant creates a radical rewriting of the allegory of the cave what if the very desire to exit the cave is itself the ultimate illusion in the cave? And yet Kant doesn't fully draw out the logical conclusions of this position. Instead, Kant holds true to the Platonic metaphysical system. He says, there is something in or beyond the world of appearances, the famed objects in themselves, and yet we can't see it. It is barred from us. It exists behind a metaphysical barrier. It's almost as if Kant rolls a giant rock in front of the exit or entrance of Plato's cave and says, we are stuck. We can never think beyond the cave. We can't exit it. And Hegel finds this horribly depressing. Hegel essentially says, Kant has missed the point. Kant hasn't gone far enough. What Kant should have seen is that he opened the door to what Plato couldn't see, which is, it's not simply that essence and appearance are divided, it's that essence has to emerge as appearance. In other words, essence has to be conceptualized by the subject in order for it to exist. I'll say it in a very formulaic way here, namely the Hegelian ontology is that essence only appears after and through the fall, which is to say Hegel's ontology is that the fall retroactively generates that from which it appears to be falling. And yet, as is true with Hegel, this formula by itself doesn't tell us very much, so I'm going to try to explain it here in slightly more clear terms. Hegel takes the idea of subjectivity, which seen from the Platonic perspective is lowly and fallen. And he essentially takes the subject and its higher opposite, the absolute, and he pretends that they are two poles engaged in a Socratic dialogue. In other words, Hegel takes the binary poles of the Platonic metaphysical system and brings them into dialectical opposition. Namely, it's not the subject is fallen from the absolute. It's that the absolute, like Socrates in the Socratic dialogue, requires the antithesis of the subject. Therefore, the subject becomes the interlocutor for substance, the absolute. Which is to say, the absolute could not be truly absolute without being negated in and through and by the subject. Therefore, to go back to the literal definition of dialogue, for Socrates, dialogue was simply the individual reasons of two people being cast back and forth. Hegel elevates the dialogue to the dialectic, which is the dialogue between reason and subjective reason as such, the dialogue between essence and appearance as such. And now essence and appearance are no longer mutually opposed. Now essence emerges only in appearance and vice versa, appearance is necessitated for the emergence of essence. And what appeared therefore to be two poles is in fact one pole bouncing back and forth, always already one. This is the dialectic. And so the transition that we have is from the Socratic dialogue, which is a binary position, to the Kantian antinomy, which is about the irreducible mediation of two positions. How can essence be truly essence if it is reflected in appearance? To the Hegelian conclusion that it is in fact dialectical, 
that it is not by itself the thing. It only becomes what it is in negation with the other. Now, it's important to note here that the idea of the dialectic becomes truly popularized only with Marx, and perhaps especially with the work of Engels, which is to say Hegel doesn't actually use the word dialectic very much. And so what Marx does is that he essentially takes the notion of the dialectic, which is to say essence only appears through what appears to be antithetical to it, namely the subject, and he extrapolates from this his entire critique of the idea of a class society, which is to say the working class as the lowly fallen subject only appears in and through what appears to be its antithesis, namely the idea of uh, the, the, the capitalist uh, ownership, which is to say capitalism through its own apparent negation reproduces itself. The dialectical extrapolation from this would be to say that capitalism creates recurring crises, which are supposed to be its imminent demise or its conclusion, and yet its antithesis, these crises, only are further integrated back into the orderly functioning of capitalism. In other words, what happens in capitalism is dialectical. What appears to be its antithetical negation, crisis, rather becomes the very precondition for its continued existence. Now, it's a bigger argument than that, but it's perhaps important to note here for this video that Engels then comes up with what he calls the three laws of the dialectic. And the three laws of the dialectic are the transition from quantity into quality, and back again, the negation of the negation, and the unity of opposites. And I'll have to leave that for another video, but it's important to note that the term the dialectic enters into the popular and public discourse, or perhaps mostly the academic discourse, by means of the Marxist analysis of society. And so if you will, you could trace a lineage of the idea of the dialectic, going back to the Socratic dialogue, which is the elementary form of the dialectic, namely a formal proposition which reflects a metaphysical one. Then we have the Kantian antinomy, which is, if you will, an attempt to show the inner limit of the dialectic. Then we have the Hegelian opening up of the Kantian problematic into the Hegelian dialectic, substance as subject, essence as appearance. The fall retroactively generates that from which it appears to be falling, which is an ontological way of saying that what appears to be a binary is in fact a unity, a unity of opposites, as Engels would later say. And finally, the Marxist dialectic that applies some of the principles of the Hegelian dialectic to the study of history and the unfolding of class relations. And finally, Engels' three laws of the dialectic, namely the transition from quantity into quality and back again into quality, the negation of negation, and the unity of opposites. That is my attempt to explain in simple terms the Hegelian dialectic in under 10 minutes. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to download my master classes, I post a weekly one to YouTube. Uh, not to, excuse me, a weekly one to Patreon. I find it very difficult to tell people about my Patreon somehow. My Patreon has my eBooks, it has my lectures and my master classes. See you next week.